Okay, so today we're going to cover just a snapshot of what is a really broad topic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how a player interacts with the surface, and often that's, um, that is measured via a mechanical device, a surrogate mechanical device, so we'll talk a little about that. Talk a little about how pitches are changing, which we just touched on, and also just a little about football shoe selection. Um, uh, the first two parts are quite evidence-based, and the third calls on a little more clinical reasoning just to give you something to, to take away back to your clinics and, and clubs. And I hope that during today when we talk about football and possibly a little bit of Australian rules football and, and, and rugby, that you think about developing a rationale for why certain shoe and surface combinations might suit more than others or in certain cases. I quickly want to thank Ivan from the journal and uh, Danny from marketing for some of the wonderful images and pictures that they've helped me with over the last few years to disseminate some of our research. Um, it's wonderful stuff. So a good place, I think, to start with some of this is to ask the players. Um, and uh, Mears did just that in a study recently where they asked a, a large number of players worldwide what they thought of, of the playing surface and the footwear as an injury risk, and a, a high percentage of them said that they thought it, it mattered. And the things that they came up with when pushed on what matters for the surface were things like a hard, bumpy or inconsistent surface, high or low grip. So you can see there's things that they thought caused injury and things that they thought believed to increase the risk of injury, but top of the pile was a hard surface, which is interesting. Um, we'll get onto that. So when a player interacts with the surface, there needs to be uh, enough resistance in that surface uh, in both the hardness of that surface, so when you push on it, um, it will resist enough for you to, to, to push off, and also enough um, grip or traction for, for your studs to be able to sink into that surface and not, and not slip. So the, what we're wondering is, is there an optimal zone of traction or, or a window of, of, of traction and of hardness in which the athlete can, can push on that surface and perform their uh, accelerations, decelerations and turns um, without uh, having a loss of uh, performance or without, sorry, without increasing their injury risk. So I'll let you watch this. Hopefully the videos are coming through. Um, if not, basically we have a player run up to a, uh, to a grass, he's on a natural grass surface, he runs up to a sideline uh, in which the traction is suboptimal and first of all he loses his footing and then as the carpet kind of grips under his studs he has too much uh, traction and starts to really trip up. So there's two forms of, uh, well, the traction or the grip between the studs on your shoes and the playing surface is often uh, measured by a mechanical device, as we, as we mentioned, um, and it's done in two ways. Um, it's done uh, measured in the straight line, so a boot is dragged through the surface and the resistance between those two bodies uh, to movement is measured. So as the shoe breaks through that grass, you measure the, the force. And then also rotational traction is where the shoe is dropped down into the surface and rotated, and as the studs release from the surface, we get a, a, a number for how much um, force that was in newton meters, so a, a, a torque number, if you like. And rotational traction is really the one that's been uh, linked to injury risk in, in the literature and in the past. Um, it's where we get this sensation that the foot has been trapped on the grass and unable to release or turn, and then torque is transferred to proximal structures. And over, over the years, athletes coming in after their ACL injury or syndesmosis injury um, will often say that exact thing. It felt like my foot got stuck on the surface and wouldn't turn or wouldn't release. Um, Dracos and colleagues did some work with cadavers where they put a strain gauge into the ACL. They put different football boots uh, on, on the foot and rotated a surface below that, different surface combinations. And the higher uh, traction shoe and surface combinations um, significantly put more strain through the ACL uh, on, in that study. That's also been done recently with actual humans. So um, Sinclair had some run, uh, this is lab based, but run up th over a force plate, do a 180 degree turn and run back. And the shoes that had higher friction or traction or grip between the surface and the shoe um, put more force on the ACL through their modeling 
than the, the, the group here that had lower um, friction or traction. Now, interestingly, they found that the, found the rotational element mattered to the amount of strain on the ACL, but the amount of grip in a straight line did not matter. Now, Dowling and colleagues um, looked at some uh, what happens when athletes cut or change direction and found that in higher friction surfaces or higher traction combinations of shoes and surface, um, we get into some biomechanical adaptations that could be classed as a little more risky. So um, the athlete plants their foot wider away from their center of mass. Um, they have more knee valgus moments, uh, less knee flexion, so forth. Okay, it's always uh, good to remember that these are some small, uh, well, these are some factors in a much larger overall multifactorial reason for why, say, someone gets an ACL injury. It's an excellent work by Bittencourt that's been adapted uh, to look at an ACL injury. Um, but I guess in that vein, the reason for looking at it, uh, there are some uh, factors that we cannot change, our age or a previous injury, but then there are others that we might be able to modify. So if you look at our player again and we examine you know, who gets injured, why and when it happens, we start to ask some questions about some of these risk factors that we might be able to modify. And we might be able to, if we have the right information and good communication lines, we might be able to modify the way services are prepared for the games that come on them or training pitches by talking to ground staff. Um, but we also might be able to uh, sort of change what we put on our feet to match the surfaces we play on. And in fact, the footwear you choose is one of the sort of um, few things that once it gets to close to game time that the athlete has control over what they, what they uh, put there. So where to start? Um, we, uh, we had to start somewhere and at the start of your PhD, you usually want to check what the, what the published evidence is or what's out there in the literature. So we conducted a, a systematic review in which we wanted to see any studies out there that have measured uh, the traction uh, with machines. So they've dragged the machine around to the playing surfaces on the actual field that the athletes play on, so not lab-based, and then link that to any injury rate. Okay. So this is our machine in, uh, in Doha um, that we got through the research department in Aspatar. And basically it shows a rotational traction okay. test where the shoe's been turned. At the top, there's a torque wrench which will give you a number. So we wanted to see, that, is there studies out there that have done this? Um, we did this systematic review and, and BJSM accepted it. They also designed a lovely, a lovely cover which... Um, I really like, but I'm, as a podiatrist, I'm concerned this guy's got the, the wrong shoes on the wrong feet might be the issue. Um, in, the, in the end, there was three studies that we found, only three, uh, that had about 5,000 male American football players. And when we pooled those results, we found you're over two and a half times more likely to sustain an injury in the, in the greater rotational traction group. Um, so these three studies when pooled showed it was actually about 2.7 times more likely to sustain an injury. Um, the first looked at only ACL injuries. The second, severe knee injuries. And the third, all lower extremity injuries with a, uh, with a focus on ACL injuries and ankle syndesmosis injuries. Interestingly, no studies for soccer football in that group. Those three were all American football studies. Um, and of note, uh, a friend of mine, Dave Rennie, a physiotherapist who until recently was at Leicester City Football Club, just completed his PhD and um, found no link with surface hardness and injury in football as yet either. So um, much work to do given that the athletes rate it as their number one concern when they play on surfaces. So just looking at one of the, the final study from that systematic review, it was an American football in 2013. These guys uh, went out and dragged a shoe surface machine over all the pitches that the athletes played on. They took the actual boots that the athletes used, tested them and took them back to the players. And they did this over a three year period. So it must have been a, a logistical nightmare. Um, and what they found that shoes and surfaces that came together to have a low rotational traction had this many injuries, 
and shoe and surface that came through and had a high rotational traction were grouped and had a lot more injuries. Um, it's quite alarming difference in, in the injury rate there with the high rotational traction group. Now they also tested translational traction, which is a straight line traction we discussed, and found that the athletes that had higher translational traction uh, actually had less injuries. So it seems that we can possibly tune these two aspects of traction. The straight line translational traction we really need for acceleration, deceleration, uh, and these sorts of things. But the rotational traction seems to be the one we want to try and independently tune to, to reduce. And that was their recommendation. Okay, so what my, uh, and getting back to that, that was in American football only. Um, so what might uh, an injury look like when you have um, high rotational traction? Um, and the easiest way to look at that is at a, an area where there's a boundary between um, a lower traction surface and a higher traction one. I'll let you watch this video. <coughs> so hopefully that's playing, but basically a player runs up on a, on a natural grass pitch or a hybrid reinforced pitch. It's concentrating on the ball, steps over onto a much higher friction surface and rolls the ankle. So they're not expecting this change, this inconsistency between the two uh, amounts of traction or hardness, and then we have an issue. This has also happened in, uh, in AFL. Um, basically, if you can see here, there's natural grass right along the side of the pitch, and then in this technical area, they've filled it with uh, artificial pitch. So this player was concentrating on the ball, ran over, and shoe basically got stuck as he turned, it just wouldn't release. Um, there is a video of this, but I'm going to skip it because it looks like Teams is working slowly. Um, this particular case ended up with the lawyers um, in a legal dispute over the stadium, Etihad Stadium, putting this artificial grass this close with um, natural grass everywhere else. So you have to be mindful that these things are starting to end up uh, with the lawyers. Okay, so back to our... Um, our stadiums. Uh, some good news. Aspire Sports Turf and FIFA uh, Supreme Committee have come together to recommend that the stadiums in, in Doha for World Cup 2022 will have five metres of uh, sideline between where the artificial grass starts and the side of the pitch, giving players lots of room to, uh, to run outside the line if they're running along the sideline, etc. There'll be three metres at the training sites. Um, which is also fantastic news. Um, anywhere we've been to speak on this particular subject, we've pushed really hard, we've pushed this on Twitter and we've pushed this in our publications. Um, so it's fantastic to see this, uh, this development. So what came next for us? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Basically from there, we wanted to look at what happens with different grass types or any other factors that might affect this interaction. So obviously so many things can affect how this player interacts with that surface, the movement strategies they choose, the climate on the day, whether it's hot or cold or rainy or dry, um, even the temperature, um, the, t the type of grass or the grass species seems to be one also. So John Orchard did some research and found that there are less or fewer ACL injuries on uh, particular grass species, ryegrass, which is a, a, a cool season grass or winter grass, compared with Bermuda grass, which is a, a summer grass for hot and dry climates. So in Doha, we have this situation where across the QSL or across our training pitches, for most of the year while it's hot and dry, we would have either Bermuda grass or Paspellum grass. So these grasses are both warm season grasses that are quite strong um, and have been linked with some higher injury issues. Um, in winter, when the weather becomes a bit cooler, January and so forth, they overseed them with rye grass, cooler season grass, um, to keep co coverage on the pitch. So we have these two different situations uh, occurring. ACL injuries and ankle sprains uh, were shown to be more likely in warmer climate zones of uh, European soccer and AFL. And I think from memory that Achilles injuries were more common in the cooler zones. So there are kind of climatic reasons for different injuries, it seems. So we started, and the title sort of give this away, um, 
we got six different football shoes, uh, looked at one elite playing surface, which was the national team surface in Aspire, uh, tracked the weather, and we really wanted to assess the variation in this traction between the shoe and the surface over a full season. Um, we did that by using a machine that we had made in the US, so a commercially available, quite simple machine. Um, and the reason to use a machine for this is it's just re re reliable or repeatable, if you like, to be able to drop that, that shoe down with the same amount of force and rotate it uh, in, a, in a repeatable matter, manner. Obviously, we'd, we'd love to measure this in humans running over the pitch, and we're working on that as well. But it's a lot harder to get them to run exactly the same way um, thousands of times to test different shoes and different surfaces. So for the moment, it's a surrogate mechanical machine. On this machine, you have an artificial foot. Uh, the whole assembly turns, the weights we lift up and drop down, and the studs drop into the surface. You then turn a simple torque wrench and get a measurement. Um, the assembly also slides forward. So with this strain gauge, you can pull it forward and the shoe will slide across the surface. And as it releases from, or the resistance uh, eases, you'll get a measurement in, in Newtons. So the first one on the torque wrench is Newton meters, and the one down here is, is Newton. So it's, it's force, essentially, rotational force and linear force. At the same time, we measured these spots. Uh, we measured lots of locations on the pitch. We measured the hardness of the surface. So in here, you have a little uh, missile that drops down a tube called the Clegg hammer. Once it hits the bottom, there's a deceleration that occurs uh, at the surface and we get a rating in Gs. So if there's a very fast deceleration, you'll have a high number. If there's a slow deceleration, we'll have a low number. So that means a softer pitch. We also tested soil moisture to see how much, uh, how wet or dry the pitches were, um, looked at humidity, temperature, and a whole manner of things at the same time. The six shoes were in different outsole groups. So we had um, some from what's called an artificial grass outsole, which means small, round, short studs. We had a lot of shoes from the firm ground outsole group, which is probably the most common group used, and they can be blades or round studs or combinations of both. And then we had a, a soft ground shoe with screw-in metal studs. Um, in this case, they were 11 millimeters at the front and 13 at the back. You can interchange these studs to be longer. So, just an example of what they look like, the side profile of those groups. They tend to be short, round, and lots of them in the artificial ground studs, a little bit longer and a little uh, different shapes in the firm ground, and then these kind of long, conical, soft ground studs, probably all seen before. All right, on this figure here, we have rotational traction on the vertical axes. So the higher the number goes, the higher the resistance to the shoe releasing from the surface. Down the bottom, we have the months in which we did the testing on the field, um, and we also have what type of grass it was, whether it was a warm season grass, switched to that cool season in January, our cooler month, the transition, so we have some warm and some cool, and then onwards. The groups, so the grey uh, group here is the soft ground studs, and they stayed consistently higher in terms of, of traction across the season. See, we all had a relative dip here across the groups. The firm ground group is the orange uh, when they're all average. And then the last group is this sort of smaller studs, which are sitting right down low in terms of rotational traction. You see in January, this is getting quite, quite low. And we might find that if we um, have the athlete run a kind of traction course and feel that they're slipping or losing any performance, that we might then adjust up to a different stud type. So from this, I think it's, it's, uh, we can conclude that traction does vary given different uh, grass types and different climate. We obviously have some hot months and humid months and some cooler, dry months. Um, and that you can adjust the type of outsoles you use to the conditions that you come across. So I guess the next question is, what, uh, what, can, we, what can we say about this? You know, what's, what's, what use was any of that? Um, this kind of logotastic slide here um, is a piece we did for the Aspatar Journal where we asked physios and podiatrists from a, a lot of clubs, um, some inter international federations, uh, the women's Australian Matildas soccer football, club, uh, football team, uh, women's AFL, men's Australian Reels football, so a lot of different practitioners and also an NFL uh, franchise. 
and we asked what they thought about um, athletes returning after their ACL uh, reconstruction or surgery and when they start running again. Because at some stage, they've got to get back on that pitch, put a shoe on their feet and run again. So if you want to read that, it's open access. But basically, we asked, are there any surface considerations, any shoe uh, considerations, what seems like a good idea? And the conclusion was that reducing rotational traction is something that we, you know, it seems like fairly pragmatic advice and, and, and intuitive at this stage. Um, should they return straight away into their soft ground shoes? Probably not, um, unless they're being rushed back into a, a Champions League final or something. It seems like the, the risk is high and the reward is quite low. And the same, I would say, goes for situations where players are taken on pre-season trips to the USA, Singapore, Asia, areas where the, the maintenance of the grass surface may be different, may have warm season grass. Should they look at having outsole options um, when there's not a lot riding on it? It's, it's a sponsor commitment rather than something where you'd rather roll the dice. I understand players may not want to slip, so defenders and goalkeepers will often wear screw-in studs. Um, they get held from the coach if they slip over and, uh, in a large moment of the match. But on the, on the other side, if you're doing your on-field rehab or you're in a, in a match in which there's um, not a lot riding on it, it doesn't seem like a great idea. And so it, I should say that we also tested the straight line traction on all of these shoes back in our study and didn't find a large difference. Um, since then, we've piloted athletes running into different shoe types and they've subjectively uh, relayed to us that they're not having uh, episodes of slipping. So we now have had um, some, some quite uh, large players and in, in the large profile players that play full time in these AG smaller studs because the pitches are evolving and, and the traction is there. So the recommendation really is that athletes should try and select footwear with the least rotational traction values and which no detriment in performance results. So you don't want them to slip, of course. We also don't want that shoe to get stuck. And I feel that's particularly important as this information trickles down to, to youth players that can play on suboptimal pitches, to women's the women's game that also sometimes get thrown onto suboptimal uh, surfaces and artificial surfaces. At this stage, it's always good as a researcher to have someone tell you that correlation and causation are not the same thing. Um, and I was reminded by Angus, my seven-year-old son, about that with his favourite joke. So, how do you know carrots are good for your eyes? You never see rabbits wearing glasses. Okay, so there's some logic in that. Um, but it does remind me that mechanical traction testing may not tell us a lot about how a human moves and interacts with the surface. We are doing other projects where we have wearable technology on athletes to see what happens when they run around and also to rate subjectively how they feel. But this is one way to, to at least check the surface in the shoe. So indeed, work, more work is needed to make that final link. We have it in American football, but we do not have it in soccer football as yet. And that's something we've been working on for the last three years. Um, and I'm hoping to quite soon meet up with the wonderful team at ASPREV uh, and the data from the NSMP practitioners to see how our surface traction data and our hardness data matches up with what happens in, the, in terms of injuries at certain times of the season. So there's news to come on that soon. Next section of this, I just want to quickly talk about hybrid pitches. Um, I mentioned them at the start for the World Cup stadiums. Um, certainly, surfaces in general are really evolving. We wrote a piece for the Aspatar Journal uh, on this, and you can, again, it's open access. Please go and read it if you're interested in this. But effectively, we talked about how most surfaces in the, in the modern game are sand-based, so the water can run through them. Um, they have excellent drainage. You don't often see waterlogged pitches anymore. Um, so there's not often loss of performance. The ball really skips along. In fact, generally they'll add water via the sprinklers to the surface so that the ball uh, does fizz along the surface and they drain very well through the sand. Sand's unstable though. So they're starting to use some fibers or they have used for the last 20 years. Fibers that then stabilize the sand um, to stop it from breaking down and shearing and, and, and failing underneath our feet, uh, in which the natural grass then grows through. So we have these long fibers that are stitched into the surface 
around 200 millimeters down and they're stitched every couple of centimeters um, and then the natural grass uh, intertwines around these. They're green, they're just under mine height so they add a little bit of robustness in terms of um, players trampling on them or the ball bouncing or in the World Cup they'll obviously be opening ceremonies and, and concerts and different things. So they add to the surface being able to um, tolerate match congestion. Okay, do excuse my, my shaky handheld video, but basically what we have here is a really large sewing machine that is stitching uh, these fibers down into the sand, uh, punching it down. You can see all the coils of fibers here. It's probably quite jerky, but hopefully you get what I mean. There's coils of these polypropylene type fibers that they stitch down, and then here we see them right along the surface, and this is at the turf farm in Aspire. The grass will grow through this, and then you'll no longer see them as, as clearly, but they are there. So they look like this, um, that, that sand reinforced by the fibres, uh, and then there are different ways to do that. So you can have the stitching, which is the most common and which I believe will, will be here in Doha. Um, you can also have mat-based systems, which have this kind of mat with tufts that go up. It doesn't have anything in the sand, but the roots all grow through it as well. Um, we have this in the turf farm that we've tested. And there are others like Arsenal Trials where you have cork that's been added to the to the, some microfibers and sand and trying to provide some shock uh, absorption or energy return. Um, so there's all different types of hybrid uh, reinforcements and the most common being that sort of stitched um, fiber uh, that we saw. So research-wise, it's fairly thin. Um, these pitches are relatively new. They've been around in elite football for quite some time, but there's not a lot of research on them as yet. There's certainly a lot of conjecture on how, if they increase the hardness or the friction of the pitch, um, they certainly make it more playable, very uniform and uh, extremely good for television because they look wonderful. Um, the rotational traction seems to be like natural grass from some of the studies. There doesn't seem to be a huge difference, although some shoes can uh, have a little higher traction than others. A um, study by Smeets found that some of the bladed shoes had higher rotational traction on the hybrid pitches than they did on just uh, unreinforced natural grass. Probably have noticed that the rotational traction does not uh, massively decrease when the surface is wet because they drain so well. Um, you may not have to change the boots around uh, a lot for for when the weather is a little bit wet. So I think you've grown up playing in the wet, you're automatically going to reach for your soft round studs, and that may not always be necessary. Um, they're generally harder, they become compacted, and players will at times complain about them, um, We meaning that they need to be maintained in a certain way. So good communication with ground staff to to make efforts to, to change how hard they are is, is essential. But they're very stable and very consistent and really with a, with a match schedule um, like Dr. Celeste showed us uh, in, in an earlier lecture that's coming up for the World Cup, these stadiums are going to have many, many matches with not much rest to grow that grass. They're going to use grow lights um, to enhance how the, how the grass grows, so those artificial light rigs that sit over the grass. Um, but this reinforcement uh, is a requirement. We've just quickly, we've done some research ourselves in the turf farm looking at um, hybrid uh, surface, some hybrid surfaces and some ryegrass like they'll use in November, December. And we didn't find a huge difference across the shoe groups. We tested lots of different shoes. There were some individual shoes that did jump up a little bit, but no significant differences in the rotational traction. Which, uh, which is good news. Um, they can use the, the hybrid reinforcing without having to, to worry too much about that. But they might have to tune the shoes in terms of how hard the surface gets. These smaller ones, obviously, if the surface is very hard, then they're gonna work well, much better than, than the, the soft ground ones. Um, but depends on the conditions of the day. So what can we do about any of that? Um, well, we can get to know our ground staff. This is Wayne Holmes, a Kiwi that has 
uh, just left after 11 years at Aspire, who just uh, looked after fantastic surfaces in Aspire Zone and, and across the QSL. Um, this is him collecting uh, uh, data at Al Saad training pitch. Um, basically, these guys are out measuring lots of different positions uh, 52 weeks of the year. So this data is coming in weekly for how hard the surface is, how much moisture might be in that surface, and the maintenance practices um, are all documented. So that's something we can actually get from them if we speak to them. Um, there will be uh, there will be windows or, or zones for where they want the pitches to sit in terms of these properties. Um, so for the hardness we just talked about in G's, the green zone is between 70 and 90 for UEFA. Um, that might be a little bit different out here. They'll have their own that they've uh, come up with out of Spire Sportster. But we can see if it's too low, it becomes very soft. So under 60, if it's over 100, it becomes very hard. The same goes for the amount of moisture. There's a, there's a zone. Um, if it's too dry, it becomes hard. Too wet, it becomes soft. And traction. So the traction that you know when that kind of studs release. At the moment, they only have uh, a green zone that says above 30, but they only have a lower limit. So they're worried about slipping. So under 20 newton meters is too low. Um, but really, we have no upper limit. I'd probably like to see the development of of a window like there are in some of the other zones. Now, if we can combine some of this objective data, the numbers that come in from these guys, with some subjective uh, information from the teams, then we can have a really good communication lines with the ground staff where we're not just complaining, we're not just saying all the time that the players complain about this or to fix it. We can have uh, a nice kind of communication loop going on. So an example of that is an uh, Australian Rules Football Club asked me to help them out um, and what they what they have what we have here is uh, the players subjectively rating from one to five the hardness of the playing surface they play on, five being the the, the hardest um, and one being the lowest. So basically, it's the average of the team for how hard they felt it was during that match on their match day stadium. We then have this jump here um, to it being a little higher. And this, after two seasons, this is or a season, this is when they got in touch because this coincided with the highest um, foot and ankle injury rate that they've had in 17 years of data collection. So they had a um, a new match day stadium, which is hybrid reinforced, and a new uh, playing venue, which was also hybrid reinforced. So the players started rating the venues higher and also started to complain of niggles and things. So if we can discuss that with the ground staff, we have objective data saying that the, the, it's a little harder and the players are saying they can do something about that. So they can work on bringing some air into that surface and softening it up. They can also work on bringing the traction down if need be by um, doing what's called verti cutting or stripping some of the lateral root growth out. So there's lots of different maintenance practices to bring this um, this rotational traction or hardness of the surface down. So one of the clubs I went to speak to in the English Premier League, after I left, they came up with a, a scheme to give more information to their players. So they have their training sites and their main pitch. They give them a, a kind of idea of what, where the range is that they want for hardness and traction, and they give that information to the players, tell them how much chance of rain there'll be, some information, and they recommend a footwear group. Um, the caveat here, obviously, is, is it's not legally binding. It's a, it's a window and a recommendation. But I think players feel like this is being done for them. They have information um, and they seem happy with that so far. Okay, so I certainly don't have enough time to go into artificial pitches and the differences, and I'm happy to talk about that with people offline. Um, but in my experience, uh, in the 22 years of clinic, this has been generally the story between uh, women and, and male players. Um, this is Dick Allen uh, explaining his dislike for AstroTurf. Now, I probably have a skewed sample in that I get to see the injured people, but um, I think listening to the players about what they do and don't like is, is reasonably important. Uh, any of the, and I don't think this has changed for an awful long time. So in the Lancet 1933, they talked about this, and we, we shouldn't forget that um, 
whilst we might not have the tools to work out uh, in a very sound research methodology what's going on, um, it, it's the number one issue for 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 players uh, is the hardness or the traction of the surface. So, in a recent report uh, from Scandinavia, um, 460 professional players said that you know, a high percentage of them said that artificial turf increases the injury in their opinion. The players were concerned with surface shifts, or, although there isn't great evidence for this. And interestingly, for the first time ever in any of these questionnaires, the female football players said they preferred artificial pitches. And that uh, was interesting. And then when you drill down into that and what the reason for that is, it's because the, the pitches uh, that they are offered are so substandard in natural grass that the only way they can get a decent game is on some of the artificial grass surfaces. So the problem with artificial grass, in my opinion, is that often federations and management think that it is maintenance free, and it certainly is not. Um, the fibers fall over, the rubber crumb gets spread everywhere, and it needs uh, to be maintained well. And at high schools, we see some shocking examples of this where they're just not maintained, and there's very, very hard and uh, high traction surfaces. Um, there, there isn't great evidence that injury rates are, are higher in soccer football, I should say, with x strand studies and things, but there is evidence for increased ankle injuries. And in recent times, in a large NFL study by Mac and another large rugby study by uh, Ranson, it shows there are more lower, limb, uh, lower extremity injuries, especially at the foot and ankle. They seem to bear the brunt of this change under the turf. So we've started some research in rugby on this very thing, looking at the perceptions of, of football boot use, rugby boot use, and the surfaces they play on. And the pilot information has came in that players definitely thought the playing surface affects injury risk. Um, unbelievably, 74% of all the, the, this large cohort thought that an injury had been caused by the playing surface, which for me seemed really high. So they tuned into the knowing um, how the surface feels and what it does. And 100% of the replies said that they had more muscle and joint soreness after the artificial grass, um, up to 48 hours after. Um, some of the interviews, some of the things they wrote were things like long studs feel really unstable on the artificial grass, could feel like I can go over on my ankle, and we often got the foot feels like it gets stuck and doesn't release, and there was an awful lot of stuff about abrasions. So by no means is that a... a, a you know, an evidence-based overview, but I think if, we, if we're listening to the players, that's an important thing to begin with. Um, so footwear is obviously involving as well, evolving as well, but um, here we have Adidasta first tuning the shoes, um, the founder of Adidas for the, for the World Cup in which this team was more successful when he put longer studs in for the wet surface. Um, but we should be mindful that, you know, all these, it, the evolution of the playing surfaces and the evolution of the studs uh, leading to higher and higher traction, but humans can't utilize all of that. So once you get to a certain amount of traction, we can only utilize so much and we're not actually um, getting improved performance. So we're starting to possibly increase the injury risk. Football boots, what do they do? They certainly increase the, some of the ground reaction force, the peak ground reaction force and loading rates are higher if you run in a football boot compared to trainers or something or a turf shoe. The plantar pressures from the, from the studs that push through the shoe are higher in certain regions. The traction is obviously higher and ankle and knee joint moments on change of direction are higher, but that makes sense. You have that grip to be able to really get the purchase to, to, to turn and, and, uh, and change direction. Um, I think we should be wary that there is anatomical variations. So this is more clinical advice. There are, you know, studs that will push through on certain bony landmarks or anatomical areas, and there is variation. There's people with longer second metatarsals or shorter first metatarsals, wider feet, etc. So please use the podiatry department. We can grind down one of these studs or alter where they may be pushing. If an athlete has an issue with the sin, with the sesamoid bones or something, for instance, we can do something about that. And um, we should remember that there are very different foot types. This is a Belgian team. There's different widths and, uh, and shapes and that there is variation. So there certainly isn't one boot fits all. Um, one of the things we really would, would make sure we, we can work out is that they don't get any overhang of the fifth metatarsal over the plate of, of the shoe. 
um, especially in athletes that are consistently doing this on their stance leg. So the guys who practice the penalties, practice the um, corner and set play kicks, they really roll over onto this outside of their foot if their technique is, uh, is um, good for curling that ball in. The name of the game really is making sure that any studs on the shoes <clears throat> penetrate fully to the plate of the, of the, the sole plate. <clears throat> If we're not getting penetration, we're going to have high pressure areas directly over these studs. We'll probably have a loss of traction and it'll defeat the purpose. So we really need to match up the, the hardness and the soil moisture with the, the studs. And one way to do that, sure, we can try and use data, it's difficult, is just go back to basics. Have your player run over some what's called a functional traction course. So they have timing gates here. We can see what the performance is. They run slalom through these cones and come back again and you can time that. Simple acceleration course you can time. And they subjectively rate whether the traction felt like, you know, not enough, very good, uh, just right sort of thing. So they can use their intuition, which I think uh, players that have spent a long time in, in football boots can probably do. Until we can get the information on the, what the mechanical tests tell us, I think going by feel, so to speak, may be the best thing that we have. Um, reminding players that they also have these groups, and sometimes, uh, in my experience, even at the very elite level, the agents give them a certain shoe and they just go with it, not realizing that this same shoe might have four different types of, of outsoles that they can choose. So while you can have this elite, you know, you can have this upper that you like, so let's say it's kangaroo leather that you really want, you can have that in, in, in all the different stud types for that whatever, Nike Tiempo or Adidas Nemesis or whatever. So some of the biggest managers that have, that have spoke to me about this at these clubs I visit do not realize this. They say that player is this particular contacted player, that's the boot they're going to have to wear. So we do have to get that information out. This is Harry Kane doing exactly that for the Champions League final. He's having a run on the day before, on the captain's day if you like. He's trying his firm ground studs. He's trying his soft ground studs. He's trying to work out what feels good on that surface um, for the movements that he's doing. Okay, so ground staff are key. I think we need to get them into the into the uh, conversation. Try and use a traction course. Probably boils down to not using a really high friction or traction shoe on a high friction surface. There are two things that have to come together to make that uh, to make those uh, that relationship um, very high. So we can you know, tune that. If it's a really high friction surface, we can bring in a lower friction shoe and see if they meet somewhere in the middle. And again, my friend, the ear, we have to keep listening. Um, uh, similar to, to Paul Dykstra's wonderful, you know, publication on, uh, on having the athlete at the center and everyone involved, um, I think bringing the ground staff in and bringing the federations in who make the rules about, you know, where the, where the sideline is, the artificial turf, this sort of thing, Collaborating with footwear companies to, to alter how um, outsoles are produced to make the game safer and having our medical, physio, sports science and teams working together um, is, a, is a wonderful way to move forward. For us, what's next? As I said, we've been dragging that machine around the, the pitches of the QSL for nearly three years. So we're going to see does traction really match up with injury um, in soccer football. Uh, we have some studies going on uh, in the Premier League um, that looking at perceptions of football boot use coming soon. And we're going to continue with these industry collaborations. Um, and really, this one I wrestled with a lot. Uh, obviously, once you're, once you're doing research with any, any industries, you're, you can probably be seen as being somewhat biased. But uh, these industries have no say on our publications or on the data. They... Um, they actually want to be involved because we can do it by just buying the shoes and, and they feel like they can get something out of it. So I'm happy to say that some of our data and our suggestions have gone into the outsoles that will be at the 2022 World Cup and a women's shoe that's being produced for the 2023 World Cup in Australia with the chief aim in the women's shoe to decrease rotational traction while keeping performance up. So for me, if that trickles down to people like Ava, who, who's a football mad, my daughter, then that will be surely worthwhile. Thank you.